Okay, so welcome everybody. Hello, my name is Brianna. I'm the communications manager for the town and I'm joined today by John Thompson, code enforcement officer for the town of Amherst, also building inspector and building inspector. I'll have him go into that a little bit more and community liaison officer Bill Laramie and your town manager Paul Bachelman. So before we um, have introductions. I'm going to ask Paul if he has any general updates to share with anyone. Sure. I just have a couple things. I know this is going to be a rich uh, conversation, so I don't want to take too much time. Uh, I'm really pleased that the town council passed the, the town's budget for FY21 on Monday. So very um, pleased by their action in that we now have a budget for FY21. And so that's all really good news. Um, and uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. And I'm sure there'll be lots of things that come up during the course of this conversation. Yes, I, I think we, we've already got a bunch of questions that been, have been submitted, um, but I would like the time, take a few minutes for John and Bill to introduce themselves. Um, two of my favorite colleagues, we used to work on the same team a couple years ago. Um, so John is on my top left square, so I'll ask him to unmute and go first. Hi, I'm John Thompson. I work for the town of Amherst as a building inspector, health inspector, and the senior code enforcement officer. So I'm dealing with building code, sanitary code, and uh, zoning bylaws. Um, and my particular focus is rental housing, the health and safety of rental housing in Amherst. Awesome. Thanks, John. And then Bill, if you could take a moment to introduce yourself as well. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Bill Laramie. I'm a police officer here in town. I've been with the town for 25 years. Uh, in the last five years, I've taken on the role of neighborhood liaison officer. So what that kind of encompasses is working with members of the town, the university, and then the community to improve relationships. It's mostly centered around students and their impact on our community, both positive and negative. So that's kind of my role in a nutshell. I do work a lot with John and others in town. Great, thank you. Um, I do see that a, a couple of new people just joined the room and I wanna remind you that we encourage you to ask your questions live. Um, you can do so by raising your hand in Zoom or pressing star nine from the phone, or if you'd prefer, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and I will read your question aloud. Uh, so well, first question I have here is, how does the town work with the university when there are house parties normally or, or any other large gatherings? Um, how was that done in the past and how is that gonna look differently um, due to COVID? So I can start just based upon a police response. We'll take it at its most simplest form. So, you know, we, we expect as in the years past to respond to quality of life complaints and we'll talk about the noise complaints specifically. So. You know, we respond, we identify whomever resides there, and depending upon the outcome, it is shared both with John as well as property managers and landlords, and then ultimately with the university. So we meet weekly with a team from both the university and the town every Monday to kind of discuss, recap the previous week's activities and any, any events of concern to us in the incoming weeks. So it's a real fluid system. I mean, the meeting is a formality, but this stuff kind of occurs really every day. We have a real strong relationship with people at the university. And again, it's a, it's a system that works well for us. It's really kind of improved year to year. So uh, this year, I don't think it's, obviously there's more concern. You know, our, everybody's senses are heightened. So, but again, I think the communication is in place. We're just kind of, you know, buttoning up some last minute items, but I think we'll be in a good position to, to deal with anything that comes up. John, do you have anything to add to that? I uh, uh, wanna thank Bill for, for pointing out the team. You know, it's, it's um, inspections here in town. It's the fire department it's the police department, um, and it's the University of Massachusetts. We meet with them weekly. Every um, two weeks, I, I run a meeting that's attended by all of those inspectors, health inspectors, police department, uh, DPW, 
where we talk about issues in the town. So uh, we, we try to, you know, take things right as they come. And, and um, I can say that, you know, in the last year, um, I've worked on 283 violations and complaints at 93 properties in town. Um, and I don't do that alone. I do that with the help of all those other departments. Can you um, give an example of how you address it? Like maybe something that's happened in the last couple of weeks about, you talk about individual properties, right? Say, that's what right. Do about this? So I got a, a complaint about a property on North Pleasant Street, a two family house. Um, I did a, a two and a half hour video inspection of the place because I didn't want to go inside. Property manager ran the camera and um, I uh, compiled six pages of handwritten notes during that um, inspection. I put that in the form of a uh, order to correct, which was sent to the owner of the home. The house was condemned. Um, the, since, since that happened a month ago, the owner has hired a contractor. They're gutting the house. It's, it'll be a total rehab. Uh, that's a pretty successful case. I love that example, John, uh, especially now with technology, how you guys are using technology to do things that you used to have to be very present and oftentimes in people's homes. Um, and are there other ways that you guys are using technology now to, to do the work that you used to do in person? It's a lot of Zoom meetings, you know, we, <laughs> all of it happens virtually. Um, and sometimes here in town hall, uh, the, you know, there's two or three people on the call. Um, and we're, we're, we're sitting a little ways away from each other, but we're <laughs> interacting on a screen. I, I even heard that you, you bought a, a Zoom um, d technology piece for, for Bill to help, his, help him get through some of the meetings. So it's a true, truly a team effort. Yes, at the beginning of the stay home order, um, I knew that these Zoom meetings were going to be important. So I, you know, signed up and bought my own account and um, uh, learned how to do it. And we appreciate that in IT, I have to say. So thank you for your uh, efforts there. So I wanna acknowledge a couple comments and a question that came into the room just now. Um, one of them was to an update to make to the COVID-19 um, site from Abigail, which thank you for that. I just did that as we were talking. So you'll see that changed. Uh, we also have a, a comment here is it possible the town, if possible, the town should pass an emergency bylaw restricting gatherings of more than X number of individuals. X could be determined using science or health guidelines. Um, that might be more of a, a Julie Board of Health question, but I don't know if anyone here has any comment on that. I think yeah, that yeah, Bill, I think it'd be interesting to hear for you in terms of how does the, what's the police response when there is a gathering and do you have a, a number that you say that's too many or when the officers are called to respond to a house party of some sort? Uh, so I can speak to the question that was fielded as well as yours, sir. So in terms of response to parties, you know, it's really at the, just prior to COVID, it, it's really be, it was at the discretion of the officers and I think it remains as such, but I think we're gonna see a lot more calls were, you know, if there's 10 or more gathered, we're getting a call about that. So there's this little bit of a complicated intersection between what is public safety and what is public health. So that's why, you know, the question was asked around, is there going to be an emergency ordinance passed? And that's one of the questions I've been asking because as a police department, I feel like we're in, we're in a good prepared place to act upon public safety type stuff or quality of life complaints. But the piece that we feel like may be missing is what what capacity can John act? Right now, there's no direction in terms of can he act monetarily? Can, is he just going to do some type of education and outreach? So if we can get that you know, clarification on that piece, I think that is going to help us. And my understanding is there is some discussion in the works around that. So that's good to hear. I can and say a piece about this the too. Other piece. We uh, just this week um, have done have done three Zoom meetings with with properties that had complaints. So there was a police response to each of those properties. Uh, we followed up by setting up a Zoom meeting with the occupants of the 
properties and talking about the event and what, um, what our expectations are for them going forward. And, and I do have another comment that just came in um, in response to what you guys have said. Uh, they say calls are fine, but there must be a new ordinance with graded warning fines and subsequently more expensive fines. So that, um, that's just a comment to follow up on that. Another question here. Um, I am told the university does not know where its off-campus students live. During the pandemic, would it be helpful for the town to have that information? Much of that population is in rentals. So the this year, go ahead, Bill. If, if you, if you uh, look at the community agreement, there's some language in there that specifically says they have to tell them where they're living off campus, which is, it's terrific to hear that news because it's something we've on push for. And I think it's going to help with, you know, the, I think the intention behind it was around contact tracing. But I hope once we move beyond this, that it just becomes standard practice for them so we can better identify where their students are living in our community. And, and I will say, you know, as far as um, rentals in the town goes, we have a, a pretty solid inventory of which homes are rentals, but we don't necessarily have the information of whether they're students or not based on the town side. Um, so while we, we can determine which properties are rental units, we, we don't know if, who's necessarily living inside them right now. Okay, so I want to remind um, the new folks who have joined us, please put your questions into Q&A, raise your hand in Zoom or star nine from phone. Another question here, um, what are your main concerns with COVID-19 uh, with the students coming back in the fall? Um, I could jump in. Uh, I, I have the same concerns that I think most people in town have. I'm nervous about um, students gathering, um, you know, in an unsafe way. We've already seen that happening on weekends. They come back and they have parties at their houses and, you know, there's 30 or 40 people there. It's, and it looks dangerous. Um, and as a, you know, just as a 65 year old man, I, I, I'm afraid to be exposed to that. Bill, do you have any, any specific concerns? Um, yeah, I mean, my concerns are similar to John's as a, as a parent and a husband and a police officer, you know, and as a town, I think we've worked really hard to be in the place we're at now in terms of public health. And we don't want students coming here and eroding that progress. Uh, I have two teenagers, so it is a battle at times in terms of perception versus reality. So, you know, that's it's going to be a challenge, but I, as John and I have participated in many of these Zoom meetings, they know that the stakes are high and we've heard from students that they understand the severity of this and they want to cooperate. So it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to do it. So we'll see. I'll jump in for a minute and say that we've had um, meetings with fraternity and sorority management um, ongoing s since March um, about how to reopen. And we've also gone the next layer down. We've met with um, presidents of, of uh, fraternities and sororities to try to get that message rippled out. That's been one of the great things for the town is that we have, you know, inspections, uh, police, fire, everybody uh, in conjunction with the university off-campus housing folks and the community relations people all working together to get the word out and to let it be known that there is a unified um, approach to ensuring safety. It's really about safety for students, but also the general public, but it's, you know, it's, it's both. And I think that there's been a lot of progress made in the years um, since, you know, uh, the big event that you guys have made and it's, it's really refreshing to hear you on the front lines and what kind of conversations you're having hearing and then you're having and then the kinds of response you're hearing back so it's interesting that they understand the gravity but you're still wary of their if action's going to follow from those statements right mm -hmm. 
Yeah. We have another um, question in the room. We all know that very often more than four unrelated individuals are living in a single house or apartment, um, which is technically not allowed to have any more than four in the town of Amherst um, due to zoning regulations. Uh, so the question is, is the town willing to work harder to enforce this bylaw? And what would that look like? Yes, uh, it is a worry f for me as well, because that's one of the bylaws that I enforce. And um, I'm nervous this year that so many students are coming back to town with no university housing. I think that they'll be, you know, bunking with their buddies. And the way we respond to that is... Um, through complaints. Uh, you know, neighbors call and say, look at, I, I see six or eight cars parked at this house. Can you check it out? And, um, you know, we do an investigation and then we go after the property owner to rectify and comply. And John, can you talk a little bit about the complaint process, how people um, in the past have been, been able to lodge complaints about properties that they have concerns for both something a neighbor notices going on or a tenant themselves trying to get a problem resolved? Yes, so I, I uh, get complaints by telephone. I get them by email. Uh, the town has an electronic um, complaint form on, on the uh, rental page. Um, I get those, uh, you know, every day, those come in. Um, we, the way we follow up is uh, we do a little investigation we sometimes do an inspection if, if it's needed, um, and then an order to correct goes out. And I know you're a numbers guy. Do you, you know, have a sense of, in the past, what has been, from year to year, the, the largest amount of complaints that you've gotten uh, or enforcements that you've written? Does something stand out to you? You know, it runs, it runs about um, probably, well, things that I take action on, um, you know, runs about 450 to 500 complaints a year. Okay. All right. So I've got another question here. Um, this person's rem remembering issues a few years ago with um, what people are calling Blarney blowout. And they're saying that they haven't heard anything about that since then. Um, is it still a problem? Are people just not having big, big parties like that anymore? Or Bill, Bill might be best able to speak to, to what that's all about. Bill's frozen. Bill, are you there? Muted for sure. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry about that. We had some radio chatter. So oh, no in problem. terms in terms of the the event that happened many years ago, yes. It is still something we are prepared for in March. It is, in the last couple of years, it has essentially been a non-event. And again, that goes back to all this, this partners and problem that occurs. Really the work we do throughout the year doesn't change because of this one event. We do our, we do our follow ups we communication at the time. March does roll around or the end of the semester. There's not many people we haven't reached out to and had these discussions with though. Again, it's something as a, as a department we are prepared for, but lately it's been a non-event. Okay, thank you. You were breaking up a little bit there. I just, oh, you're back. Um, I have a question here for, I guess, uh, mostly for John, but um, how has the quality of rental housing improved um, over the last couple of years, now that there's a, a registration program for rentals and dedicated staff to ensuring the health and safety of our neighborhoods? Well, I think it's, it's obvious if you drive around town. Um, when I started doing this job eight years ago, you know, people stacked, left, stacked their trash at the side of the road and it just stayed there. Uh, they had cars parked all over their front lawns. Uh, the, the, the town was a wreck. Um, and, and just going after these things one at a time, the word gets out, um, you know, people know now. Um, and most people know the rules and, and will call me and complain. One of the challenges for our town is that we get an influx of new students every, every fall. 
And so it's a new education effort that, that, that everybody has to engage with. I mean, I think, you know, you know, I've only been here, I haven't been here as long as John has, but there has been a, um, a clear improvement in the rental properties and the, how they've been maintained, at least from the, the, you can see from the streets. And I think that's 100% due to the enforcement actions of the um, inspection services department. And I just was wondering, John, you don't seem to sleep if you get 450 to 500 complaints a year. <laughs> we a we have, you know, that's, that's um, just things that I've taken action on. So I, you know, I might go to one house and well, like I said about the North, North Pleasant street property, I had, you know, six pages of, of violations that's at one house. Um, so that, that bumps that number up, you know, it's, it's only 93 properties that I've been to, but there's a lot of things wrong there when, when you get inside, you know, a lot of landlords attitude is that, well, I'm just going to rent it to students. So there's no point in fixing it up. And what we've found is yes, if you rent it to them that way, they don't take care of it. If you fix it up and it's nice, they feel that um, and they don't tear it up the same way. Uh, but it's a, it's tough to explain to landlords that you got to put out that kind of cash. And the other thing that happens is we hear from a lot of parents who drop their students off in the fall saying, this is not a very good place that we just rented. I didn't even know what they rented, right? Yes, yes. Oh my gosh, I just wrote a check for $4,000. I can't believe this place. All right, I got a bunch of questions that just came in from um, attendees in the room. So the first one uh, that was asked is, what is the schedule for reopening of bars? So bars are um, later on in the governor's um, phased approach, phase three approach of um, the new normal. And I think we will be very careful about opening bars. That's a, you know, a proven um, place where viral and, and infection spread. So we will be very slow on reopening bars in this town. Um, we have another question here going back to the uh, rental property bylaw. Are there any ways to change the rental property bylaw to be able to punish property owners who rent to more occupants than permitted? Or would they or would the property owners just make quick property transfers to change the ownership to avoid sanctions? When we find those cases of overpopulation, we do enforce them. That's, that's part of what I'm talking about with the complaints and violations um, that have been successfully abated. Um, you know, I, it's obvious when you drive by someplace and there's eight, it's the same eight cars there every day for two weeks that, there's eight people living there and that that becomes an issue uh, part of the bylaw says that i can do an interior inspection um within 24 hours so you know that happens i order people to to um let me see the place and, and i and i will add to i mean it's sometimes um news to a property owner if there's happens to be more people living there some sometimes it's not it it really um it really depends and from what i've seen so i have a, a comment and a, a question here from john um, can you all speak to the years of work you've had done through the ccc and off-campus student life creating positive relationships between students and non-student residents in neighborhoods and changing the expectation and perception of umass students um, and then there's a second part of that question. Could you address specifically how those open lines of communication and relationship building actually are more effective in an emergency like COVID rather than fear, hate, and blaming? Really good question. Um, I can repeat that if you guys would like. So I, I think the yeah. first part is talking a little bit about CCC, maybe saying what that is and uh, the off-campus student life um, programs that have been happening over the last few years. Bill, you want to jump in? Sure, I can. It was a little bit broken, but I'll, I can explain to you. The CCC is the Campus Community Coalition to Reduce High-Risk Drinking. So it was started by Sally Lenowski, who is one of the deans at UMass. She's the Dean of Off-Campus Student Affairs, and she has a background in public health. So started with her and has really kind of evolved into 
people from city, people from the community, both in public health, public safety, we have business owners. The DA has a seat, so it's really kind of a discussion around, you know, behaviors that adversely impact communities in and around alcohol. So to give you an example, so I'm a chairperson of a committee that's it's crime prevention through environmental design. So it's it focused around how we can change environments to change behavior. So if you remember many years ago, we would have pretty much every weekend, we would have large gatherings in North Amherst, both on Hobart Lane and at the townhouse apartments. Um, and large meaning thousands of students would gather without warning. So we were unprepared, ill-equipped and you know, it just got to be a reoccurring theme. So. Oh, I think we lost you, Bill. I'll just jump in here. Yeah. You know, the, what, what Bill has done on this with, the, with everybody else in the town is um, actually been recognized through the International Town Gown Association as a model practice um, that other university and college towns are paying attention to. And the idea is that you, um, design things. You put up um, fences to to inhibit large gatherings, and and it doesn't. It's it's uh, and and so it, it creates a, a, a nicer atmosphere. So small gatherings are okay, but these gigantic gatherings that are and that's the sort of where it gets a little more dangerous for everyone that we've tried to uh, quell a little bit. Okay, so we lost Bill. Um, I think he might be having some connection issues, but if he pops back in, we'll, we'll welcome him. Welcome him. Um, I've got a question here from Steve in the room. Bill and John gave examples of problems being identified through complaints. If the town makes COVID related rules, for example, numbers of people together with mask wearing, would it also be complaint driven? Whether complaint driven or not, would enforcement be by police action or by the inspectors? You're muted, John. Sorry about that. Great question. Uh, it's a question we have too. We're looking for a little direction from uh, the Board of Health in town about who enforces this. Uh, that said, I'm not sure. I, I think education is the key to this. I'm not sure that this is something we can arrest our way out of. Uh, it, we need a behavioral change and we need the, the students that I've talked to seem willing to take leadership roles in this. Um, you know, and, and that's important. They they have to be in charge. Uh, that's it's a really good point because on uh, Monday the Board of Health is meeting to talk about a mask uh, requirement for certain areas of town, primarily the downtown or, or densely populated areas, which makes perfect sense. Um, and usually the health, uh, the Board of Health identifies its health agents, and a lot of times it's the you know inspectors, but also can be the police department. But a little bit later today, we are going to be talking about other ways to um, focus on education, which is what John's referencing and um, what uh, the university has found to be way more successful than punitive measures in terms of um, folks. Because if people say, hey, you have to wear a mask, um, people are usually, most people by far are more are willing to do that. I've seen it in other communities that I've been to where it's the standard and you look odd not having a mask on. So, and we want to talk about engaging with the university students and other people, um, non-police officers to engage folks to say, here's the rules down here. So I ask you to comply with it. Oh, you need a mask. Here's a mask. We've got some masks to give you. You don't have to have one. So we want to do it as a friendly, you know, please come downtown, um, enjoy. And, and you can, if you come downtown, you can feel safe because everybody will be abiding by the same rules. Yeah, and I just want to echo what John said too, you know, involving students or young people or the, who, who are, people are concerned about coming back into town, involving them in the process is huge because good policy um, isn't created in a vacuum and um, you could design something that you think makes sense and then it just doesn't take into account that audience. So I think that's really um, important that you have, you've taken that perspective, John. Um, yeah, I Bill, do, you see Bill in the audience? Let's get him back in here. <laughs> okay, I do see that um, 
Steve has his hand raised. So Steve, I'm going to um, allow you to come in and ask your question. Just introduce yourself um, and unmute. You are now in the room. Okay, did, did I, I'm unmuted. Can you hear? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, okay. So I'm Steve George. I actually am on the Board of Health, but I'm really not speaking for the board. I'm just trying to get information. And so, I, of course, I agree that education is the way. But if the town puts through an ordinance, a law, a rule, it seems like that will be really toothless if it doesn't have the real possibility of enforcement. We could just say, let's please, please, please wear a mask. Please, please, please don't gather. Uh, and I agree with that. We should do that as much as possible. But if there is to be a rule or a law, it seems to me that we should be very clear about what could happen. Maybe it would have to be a flagrant violation, obviously, or something like that. But we should be clear about what is going to happen if people don't do it. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with you 100%, Steve. I mean, I think in almost all the Board of Health regulations, there is a fine system that's in place, and sometimes it's a graduated fine. Uh, under the state law, you can go to fine up to $300. Uh, so that will be a, that, that will be your, your decision on Monday. Yeah, okay. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it, yeah. You know, the tickets, the tickets that I write are 100 bucks a day. Um, but do people pay it? Do people oh, actually? Oh, absolutely, pay? yes. Okay, all right. Yes, we collect quite a bit of money that way. Um, I know that there was a case in Nantucket where on the 4th of July, there was a big party at a rental house, you know, 30, 40 people. The, the health agent went to break it up and they laughed at him and he wrote a thousand dollar ticket. So uh, I don't think you have to write too many thousand dollar tickets in town for, for the word to get out. Good. I bet they stopped laughing after they got that bill. Um, so normally we wrap up at 1230, but I have another question and I, I feel like if people have more questions, we can go for a few more minutes if everyone's okay with that. Sure. Um, so we have a comment here um, from Abigail. It's, a, it's super spreader events like large parties that will seed large number of infections. Not wearing a mask while walking on a sidewalk downtown um, is a lower risk. Any, any comments about how um, you're anticipating handling large parties or just in general about that comment? Can you hear me, Brianna? We can hear you, Bill. You're a little choppy still, but. All right, my, my, my family made me get this iPhone 11. I don't, I don't know, I'm not convinced that this is the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, in response, you know, our response is going to continue to be the same in and around large parties. It's enforcement that is likely to change. You know, we have town bylaws for unlawful noise in nuisance houses. So I think you're probably, you're likely going to see more broad use of that this year. But I think our responses are going to be the same. And we're also, you know, again, working in partnership with John and his team. Even if we're not responding, if we make observations absent a response, you know, if we're going to be taking photographs and doing some type of documentation to give to his office too, so they can conduct some follow up. Okay, great. Thank you for filling that in, Bill. Um, so I do not see any more hands in the Oh, actually, I take that back. Um, there's one more question. We, we know how many residents have received COVID-19 diagnoses, but we don't have that information for people who work here, but live elsewhere. How can the town monitor this? Um, I, I don't know if, so, Paul, if so, you have anything yeah. to say about that. So, so the way that the MAVEN, which is the public health system, works is that it, um, it, re it reports um, information by town. Uh, the university has its own sort of, it's treated almost as its own little town, but there is really terrific uh, communication between our health director and their health people there too. So they, they share each other the information. Um, if someone is um, COVID positive, then um, uh, in our town, we will know about that. If someone happens to work in town but lives someplace else, um, typically we get notified through a contact tracing or um, the health director in that community will contact our community saying you should be aware of this situation. But the 
fundamental organization tool is by place of residence. Okay, so I am going to say that I don't see any new questions in the room or hands. Um, I'm going to thank our guests, John Thompson and Bill Laramie, for joining us today and sharing their knowledge with us. Um, before I officially wrap, is there anything any of you want to, um, any last words you want to leave people with before we close? I think we have to have John and Bill back because they've been so popular. There's, there's lots of questions for them. This was we, fun. Thanks for having us. Now we yeah, thank you. On to cooperate. Thank you. We appreciate having you. Next time, we're just going to have to get Bill a new phone, um, <laughs> but that's okay. We can do that. Um, thank you, everybody who's joined us and for all your great questions. If there's something that you uh, want to follow up on or get more details on, please email us at info at amherstma.gov or call the town manager's office at 413-259-3002. Um, we also have a cup of joe tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. with bid director Gabrielle Gould and chamber uh, Amherst area chamber director director Claudia Pasmini so please join us for that um, tomorrow at 8 a.m. Thank you and have, have a good day. Thanks Brianna take care of everybody. Thank you.